I call the member for Farrah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Very pleased to speak on today's MPI, which is about the impact of the carbon tax on state and local governments. I'd like to just pick up on some remarks that the member for Newcastle made in her contribution, and she started off by saying that the opposition denies the basic facts of climate change. That's not what this debate is about. It's certainly not what rural and regional members and constituents of mine are about, member for Newcastle. This is about if you take action on climate change, what sort of action do you take? And there's so much talk from the government about transition and transformation in our patchwork economy. There is so much jargon on this subject. And transitions are all very well, and of course we would support them if they were in the interests of the country and the interests of the planet, but they are not. So we have to look at what this government is doing with its carbon tax and the effect that it has on the people that we represent here in this parliament. And those effects are not good. The member for Newcastle talks about the steel industry, and she should know the steel industry well coming from Newcastle. And she says the opposition has no plan to match the government's steel transformation plan. But the point is, if we didn't have the government's carbon tax, we wouldn't have the need for the steel transformation plan. And admittedly, $100 million, the Prime Minister, I, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's good help in one respect for the steel industry, but it's coming from a carbon tax adjustment fund to support the steel industry. By what convoluted logic can the uh, government then say to us, you're not supporting the steel industry. Of course we're supporting the steel industry. We do not want to see an Australia where every piece of steel is manufactured overseas. I recently visited an engineering shop in my electorate of Farrah in Corowa on the Murray River, and they've provided the bridge work for some magnificent steel bridges over the Yarra and won awards for this. And I asked the proprietor, do you think in five years' time that the steel you might use in your metal fabrication shop will come from Australia, and he said, not a chance. Not the way this government's heading. No. Not the way this government's heading with its carbon tax. How ashamed we should feel to live in a country with the resources we have and to import often second-grade steel from China. How, how ridiculous that is. Now, we had the lecture from the member for Hotham about the opening up of the Australian economy, becoming competitive, floating the dollar, tariffs, uh, recognising our place in, in the integrated, globalised, modern world. Sure, you know, we all know that stuff, member for Hotham, but it's an insult to link the reforms that were made, some by Labor governments, some by Liberal governments, to this carbon tax. It's an insult to link those two things, to try to suggest that this is part of that, that this is also one of those great reforms. Now, the member for Hotham also said that economic diversification is the key to success. He's worked that out because he's travelled around regional Australia. He hasn't been to, uh, to my electorate, but he's been to the electorate of the member for Riverina and conducted one of his forums in Wagga, and he appeared on an ABC TV program in my electorate. And uh, he's even been to some more remote parts of Australia, and I, I recognise that that he needs to do that. He's come back with a message that economic diversification is the key to success. So tell me why would we be attacking our manufacturing sector and shrinking the diversified base of our economy down to something that we will, as, uh, as members of, of, of communities, struggle to deal with, particularly in regional areas. So if economic diversification is the key to success, the next logical uh, thought that the government should have is how we maintain, strengthen and sustain that economic diversification. And the last thing we should be doing is taxing it. Now, we start, I started by talking about uh, the need for action on global warming. It's something I support. I am on record as supporting that, and I'm proud to do so. don't agree with all of my constituents. Sometimes um, uh, I have very vigorous conversations with climate change sceptics, and I say, you could be right. I could be right, but I'm adopting the precautionary principle we need to take action to prevent the warming of the planet. That's a good thing. But if this government is serious about taking that action, then what they should be doing is encouraging the rest of the world. Now, the Foreign Minister uh, has been tripping through Africa and the Middle East. He's been doing good work there. I recognise that. He's made a, a, a fantastic number of visits to foreign countries. But where on his agenda has been the, uh, the encouragement for the next global 
meeting conference following Copenhagen. Does anybody even know where it will be? I probably should, but I don't because it's never mentioned. It's not mentioned by the government. If they want to see action on climate change that we can be a meaningful contributor to, then they should be encouraging the next global conference on climate change. And the Foreign Minister should be using his good offices and his links with so many of his contemporaries throughout the world to make that happen. But it's not, it's not even talked about. Everything has shrunk back to the Australian agenda. So somehow we can be this small, isolated uh, piece of action on climate change at the end of the world. Does anybody think that the American government, America being the biggest emitter of, um, of, of carbon, so-called pollution, um, does anybody think that the American government is going to go to the next election with a policy of uh, a price on carbon of $30 a tonne? Of course they're not. Uh, does anybody think that we should be taking action without our most industrialised countries going forward at the same time with us? Of course they don't if they think about it. Now, this tax has a terrible effect on state and local governments, and I happened to bump into a councillor from the city of Shoalhaven uh, in my office this morning. And Shoalhaven is a beautiful part of the world, and it has 95,000 residents, and I, so I asked the councillor, what do you think the effect of the carbon tax will be on the people you represent? He said, well, our electricity bill is $400,000 a year. And I said, wow. And he said, but that's just for running the streetlights. So $400,000 to run the streetlights for the city of Shoalhaven of 95,000 people is um, quite a lot of money. It's quite a big impost if that goes up by what the uh, estimates are, which is between 10 and 20 per cent, so let's say 15 per cent. The uh, other costs that he mentioned and other councils have, have mentioned to me are the cost of landfill. Because unfortunately, um, landfill is one of the, the, the top 500 polluters being attacked by this government. And not everything uh, makes sense in this area, because when it comes to landfill, everything that you've dumped in the ground for years is taxable, all of a sudden, to your local council. So um, they, they have to make calculations. And they, of course, you would assume, would pass on those costs to their ratepayers, except in New South Wales they face rate caps. So they can't pass on their costs to ratepayers. So where will they go? Reduce services, reduce staff, shed more jobs. You think of the services that local governments provide. We drive through our towns in the middle of the drought. Everybody who comes into a small local town often sees it as an oasis of green, calm and tranquility. The worst thing that happened was you couldn't water the lawns. Well, you think of the energy that will go into pumping water to water the green spaces in our towns and our cities. That's extremely energy intensive. Uh, you think of uh, the cost of electricity on every single council provided service, whether it's the public library, whether it's the maternal and child health care service, uh, whether it's the council offices themselves. And it is a relentless, uh, impossible burden that is facing local government, and it is one of which the Minister for Local Government, who's spoken in this debate, should really be ashamed. This tax will hit regional Australia harder than any other area. We know as members of this side of the House, because we come from regional Australia, we go home to regional Australia, and we feel the pain of regional Australia. Now, much has been made of the State Government's um, uh, reports and investigations into the cost on states of the carbon tax, and they've been ridiculed by members of the government. Can I say that in all my experience of watching state premiers in their dealings with Canberra, if they don't agree with Canberra, they say so, and if they do agree with Canberra, they say so. So when you have the premiers of Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland stand up and show results that say there will be increasing cost burdens on their states of this carbon tax, and what is the government going to do about it? Job losses, 24,000 in Victoria, 31,000 in New South Wales. They are easy numbers to say, but we know the pain of every single job loss when, uh, when we see it in our own community. Those are very big numbers. State governments, of course, are going to be hit incredibly hard by this carbon tax, and those premiers should be saying to Julia Gillard, sort this out, do something different. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, our own fabulous parliamentary library has produced some information that suggests that the um, price on carbon that would have to be put, that would make the difference that the government says needs to be made, or the government says will be made, is a price that is well above what, they're actually, what we're actually seeing. 
which means that in spite of all this pain, it is still a fraud. It is still a fraud on the Australian people. It is not going to achieve Order. the things that the they have said Honourable that it will. Member.